Welcome to the Ortho Joe Show, a joint production of the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery and Ortho Evidence. In our world, orthopedic research is king, and current topics from our respective publications are analyzed weekly. Here is Mohit Bhandari from Ortho Evidence and Mark Swinkowski from the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery. Well, good morning, Mo. It's been a late night with our uh, webinar, so uh, I, I definitely need this uh, coffee, and I'm, I'm sure you're you're uh, tasting the same. So we'll get I right am. down to it, you know. And what this is one of the sessions where we basically just take our respective uh, publications and find something of interest. So I'm looking at uh, the uh, this is uh, June 16th, and one of the uh, articles in the scientific section is from Sports Medicine. And the title of this article is Machine Learning Algorithms Predict Functional Improvement After Hip Arthroscopy for Femoral Acetabular Impingement Syndrome in Athletes. And it's from Rush in Chicago. And this uh, group did a very, very, very detailed analysis of 1,118 athletes where they had performed uh, hip arthroscopy. And what I wanted to discuss with you and, and the audience is this whole topic of machine learning algorithms. They studied a, a whole bunch of variables uh, in the ultimate impact of success or failure of the hip arthroscopy, and then included some radiographic uh, measurements, uh, alpha angle, tonus grade, mm -hmm. et cetera, the, uh, body mass index, uh, age, et cetera. And th there's a bunch of uh, machine learning algorithms that they used, uh, stochastic gradient boosting, random forests, adaptive gradient boosting, neural networks, total of six of these. So can you, <laughs> can you help me out? I don't understand any of this, Mo. Yeah, uh, I, think and, we need, I think we need someone beyond my expertise here, but I will tell you something that, um, I will tell you something that uh, it has dawned on me as a fundamental principle, right? When um, this happened early on too, and first of all, let me just also congratulate the authors. I mean, you know, to put out, you know, to do any sort of large data set evaluation and carefully evaluate data, however you use it, I think it's an important one. So um, whatever information we're getting is going to help us move the area forward. But this reminds me back in the day when I felt I had knowledge in one topic called meta-analysis and it was a black box to everybody else. And I held this knowledge and I said, well, I'm just going to keep going. And the question I'd get is what is all this? Like it's this focus, focus stuff you're doing with meta-analysis. And it took a long time actually. And I think two things happened. One is it gets so prevalent that everyone gets forced to learn about it. Yeah. Two, the, the nomenclature, the language that has so foreign to many of us becomes more natural, right? The, to us. So we you know no one would argue now if we said the word meta-analysis, I think you know, most of us would know, okay, it's a multiple studies being combined. We don't know how they do it particularly sometimes, but we understand the principle. To me, I start off with machine learning as a principle. And you know, you started off by something that says, Oh, I, I've I've been here exactly before. And I think many of our listeners have been here before, which is we identified, our goal was to identify what factors are prognostic or predictive of a particular outcome. Well, we've been here before with EBM, yeah. which is it's a study of prognosis. It's an observational study. We have a bunch of patients with a certain outcome. We have a lot of variables that we're trying to evaluate. And if we didn't, if we took away all of the machine learning language, this is basically a study being done through regression analysis or some variable that we would have done and say, okay, and we've seen this, and JBGS has published lots of these papers, and we've certainly written lots of these papers, which is we're looking to find which variables are independently associated with a particular outcome measure. So when we get into, and I think that's still the core, right? The programming core of all machine learning algorithms is still functionally the same mathematical principles that we've been using forever. So I, at a simple level, that's how I always interpret that. How does machine learning get into, into the play? Well, I've always understood that obviously it's a quality of data in, it's a quality of data out, which is one. And the other thing I've, I've also been aware of and learning more about is that the concept of machine learning to me, and again, this is my, my opinion, I'm certainly, I'm sure we're gonna get corrected by those who are far more expert than me, is the value is that there's some learning going on in the system. So somehow, you know, by building an algorithm that says, you know, here's what we think are predictive. Now, can you apply this to patients 
and then tell us, you know, what, you know, what their probability is of having a good or bad outcome. So whether we would apply it in the old school days, Mark, which is we'd have that, you know, that complicated Y equals X, you know, it'd go on and on and on as a regression model, and you plop it into a, you know, Excel file, and it would tell you a number. Yeah. The computer can do that, you know, very quickly. So I presume some of those things are happening. The nomenclature and the terminology is probably one where you and I both need to probably either open a, a manual of language, or probably I think a good idea, and you've triggered me to think this, is we should bring someone in who is a uh, expert deep learning uh, AI machine learning guest and walk through the same very principal questions we have. I've said a lot, but I think in principle, if you break down this study, it is at its core, a study of prognosis using, you know, very fundamental techniques of yeah. Uh, regression. Yeah. Yeah. And we have indeed published an increasing number of these so-called machine learning manuscripts. Uh, and they, they tend to always, always end with the need for external validation before anybody would consider this clinically useful. So that, that just brings up the, the question. I'm sure many of our practicing clinicians are thinking about this. Is there a day in the future when clinical decision-making will be reduced to these machine learning uh, algorithms where when we have a, a patient who's uh, uh, based on the the information in this manuscript, who's over the age of 40 with a tonus angle of greater than 9.7, we would say, no, I don't, I don't think, uh, I don't think we should uh, do this procedure because the chances of it uh, not working are, are extremely high. Do, do you see that coming in the future of orthopedic surgery? Well, so what you just said is what's happening around the world before uh, machine learning, before AI, and before much of anything, right? Which is bottom line is you're ultimately interacting with the patient and that patient is an individual. So when someone says to you, well, the probability of getting an infection is 2% and they say, well, doc, if I'm that 2%, I don't want it. Can you convince me that I'm not? And that's the debate that happens in clinics okay. and or every day. And so the challenge is that it's unlikely I know you can never say never, but it's unlikely that robotics and AI and machine learning are ever going to replace what we do on a daily basis, replace. Now, what it will do, I believe, is with better data, that's the first caveat, right? Because I don't think the data we're using is always, you know, it hasn't been set for these purposes. So one challenge we have always is, you know, with uh, with a new approach to, you know, in this case, we're talking about broadly AI, mm -hmm. it's, you know, 10, 20 years ago where all this data was being collected, it wasn't being collected for the purposes of these of its applications now. So we have to create data sets that are actually user friendly to the applications. The biggest challenge at a period in machine learning and AI is data quality and you know using right. data sets that are making sense. So that's the first thing. But the second thing is that it's going to help enhance what we already do uh, to the extent, and probably I would think beyond that, make it much more efficient. So having many more inputs, something as simple as digital monitoring. Look at the data we can collect now with patients with wearable devices that we didn't have access to when they yeah. left the OR. All of that's just new information, right? We would collect that information through history and physical. Well, now you're getting it real time. And you're right, it will have a proportionally, uh, a proportionally greater benefit, but it can also add a lot more noise in our system. And our challenge is gonna be signal to noise. Yeah, it's still uh, communication with the patient and having trust and I, perhaps uh, added by your own personal outcomes for an individual intervention would be helpful in a discussion with the patient. But uh, just to stick with the same topic, this is a single center with a single surgeon or group of surgeons. Uh, and what we would need to have this be universally, more universally applicable is data from multiple centers uh, to, to plug into these uh, machine learning algorithms in order to enhance their uh, their reliability. Um, well, and I fully agree, right? So once you've developed this and you've published it, I think it's great, right? I mean, you know, the whole issue of scientific um, exploration in some ways, especially in some of these new domains, when we think about these issues is to get them, get your early results out and then get the world talking about it in a way that we can start confirming it. And you listen, it is equally valuable for a different group to evaluate and say, listen, you know, we've, we've, uh, we read with interest the work that's been published. We tried to replicate it. We can't. Right. Here's what we're finding. And that once again, uncovers 
challenges and gaps, you know, in the overall algorithm, which then further can lead to uh, improvement. So, you know, positive or negative, getting information out is really important. Um, and I think that's the beginning of this. And we have to start truly talking about it more, much more openly and a much more, you know, almost shamelessly about, I don't understand what these terms mean. Help me understand them and bring in experts who can start translating this into what I think are fundamentally and principal important concepts. You know, what happens all the time is um, we learn that the word randomized trial uh, by saying it very early on, immediately give the garners more importance to whatever title we've given it. I think we're also seeing right now, as we saw with network meta-analysis, we see that with machine learning. Um, they are powerful tools, but they're not, uh, you know, we don't want to misuse the power of those tools. So, and so I think it's our job, you know, as a group, as an organization, and more importantly, as a you know, fraternity of orthopedics, to figure out what makes sense and learn about it continue to educate each other. And you bring yeah. up a very important point. The journal is very interested in publishing negative results because that adds to the debate uh, on a topic and can also, in, in, if the results are really, really solid, can prevent somebody from, from having to repeat a, a trial when the results are clearly negative. So we, we love to publish negative uh, trials. And oftentimes they don't, well, we know from, from uh, well-done scientific reports that people don't submit negative results as, as often as they should. So anyway, we, we need to continue to educate ourselves, me personally, on uh, this whole technique of machine learning uh, because uh, I, 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 am, I have a knowledge deficit and I'm, I'm gonna drink more coffee until I understand stochiastic uh, intervention. I think, so, if you, I think if you drink enough coffee, Mark, <laughs> everything becomes clear. It does uh, over time. Trust me. You know, that that caffeine boost just clarifies everything. I'm throw a little bit of, <laughs> just throw a little bit of cannabis in there. You know, it's it's it's, it's life is good. There you go. I'm, I'm not and I'm not promoting cannabis use. No, no, no. Yeah. I got it. I'm going to test the <laughs> caffeine hypothesis, though. Got it. Fair yeah, enough. Have, have a great day, Mo. You too. Uh, bye. Yeah. Bye.